Thank you, Representative Ross. I now recognize uh, my colleague from Illinois, member of the full committee, Dr. Foster, for five minutes of questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and to our witnesses. Um, you know, first off, it goes without saying that our hearts go out to all the recent victims of the recent floods. You know, it's a, um, a you know, back in 2021, a tornado ripped through Naperville, Illinois, the town I live in, and by a matter of just a couple of minutes, lives were saved because of the prompt warning that was only possible because of the close coordination between the local government, units of government, and the National Weather Service that, that you know, keeps an eye on things. And I was grateful, actually, last year to have an opportunity to uh, achieve a childhood dream where I climbed up the weather, the tower into the radar dome of, of a National Weather Service facility at Lewis University Airfield. Um, and see what's actually inside that, which is, uh, for those of you who have never been inside those little spherical domes on the top of a tower, there's a parabolic uh, antenna that's spinning around, and down below they have a klystron in a, a building, and talk to the guy that maintained the klystron. You know, these are, you know, these are great facilities, and, you know, they're most of the time not used, and then they save lives from time to time. So it's just, it, it's incredible. Now, I'm also, I guess, one of... Congress's few actual AI programmers. So I've just been fascinated by the the progress that's made made. And so, Dr. Gupta, you know, there there's sort of two different approaches that have been very effective in this. The first one is just say, give me all of the data, all the sensors we have out there, and predict tomorrow's sensors. And you can do that with almost understanding no physics, no chemist, atmospheric chemistry, or anything. Um, or you can go to a hybrid approach where you use the what's known um, about the physics of little, a little blob of air, the way they they use to sell them on supercomputers. And it seems like if you look at things like protein folding, the best approach is, is to do a hybrid of both, where you have AI supervising it, or are you an AI purist, where you just say, forget about the physics, you know. Um, yeah. I would say this is, this is the thing with like respect to scale, like the scaling laws in artificial intelligence. Even in the protein folding domain, if you look at the new research that has come up, the share of like physics goes down and share of data and the modeling goes up. So in general, this is true, I would say, even in the weather modeling space. We don't, I mean, there is definitely a role and opportunity to use these models themselves to understand the physics better. There's a lot of interpretability research that needs to be done to understand what these models are able to learn from data that we don't fully understand from a physics perspective. That's happening with respect to language and other domains as well. Now, and one of these the things that this um, committee has oversight over is the split in effort between the state-of-the-art AI machines, which are going to, to smaller and smaller data widths, you know, as small as single-bit uh, data paths, but certainly less than eight-bit data paths, which is contrary to what we've traditionally been doing, you know, 32, probably 64-bit floating point. Yeah. And the question is, what, should our investment be shifting down to these narrower data path architectures you know, for weather applications? Yeah. Or will there be always a use for the high-precision uh, part of it? I think the high-precision stuff comes from, like, the physics approaches because you can't solve those equations unless uh, if you lose position because you kind of uh, lead to catastrophic errors. AI machine learning approaches, the current ones actually, I mean, the higher position is good for them as well, but it's just like much cheaper it's to scale a waste. it yeah, up. It's, it's a waste. And so the trend yeah. in, in pure AI for commercial applications is toward the low width data yes. paths. So the question is, are we going to get two branches of supercomputing, uh, one of which the, the high precision one may have to remain federally supported because it won't survive commercially? Do you have any, when, when you said that the trend is more toward use AI and not use mathematics and physics, is that something that we should we should anticipate should be reflected in government and um, supercomputer investment? I would say this is true. This is not I, I, like you do not even I have to accept like my point of view. But even the previous chairman of ECMWF, the European agencies, Peter Bauer, does agree with the fact that operationally the AI methods are likely going to continue to improve and are the future of how operationally these systems are going to work. But physics still has a role. We need to understand how these things behave, what other observations do we need, how do we actually improve our understanding. So these things are likely going to remain in parallel for a long time. But operationally, like, what we actually need is provided by the AI models already. 
Yeah, well, it's a brave new world. You know, everything you're, you're so proud of, of understanding the physics turns out to be irrelevant. You just throw it into machine learning and get a better answer. So um, now I'm out of time here, but really appreciate this discussion. Thank you, Dr. Foster. And I'm not sure what else may be on your bucket list, but if flying into an eye wall is, uh, is on there, I'd love to have you down to our district to ride out with a hurricane hunter sometime. Okay, I'll ask my wife about that. Yeah. <laughs> so I spent an entire career in the Navy trying to avoid storms when I was flying, but they, they go charging right into it, which I admire. Well, yeah, I'll pilot a drone into an eye. <laughs> there we go. Let's see. All right. So.